Hey, everybody. Sorry, my mic was not telling me that I was on. Looks like it is now, hopefully. Otherwise, I'm talking to myself. Hi, everybody. This is Jimmy Beach. Welcome to our exposure demonstration today. Woo, there we are. We are going to go through the entire process of editing with exposure in this lesson. So by the end, uh, we'll hope that you have a clear understanding of how exposure operates and gives you an opportunity to see how I would uh, toy with it or do some editing. And uh, you can learn from that process on your own. So let's give you a little bit of info about exposure before I begin. And that is that exposure is our advanced non-destructive raw photo editor and organizer. So it handles a full post-processing workflow, as you will see. We're going to use it to copy images from camera cards and then apply editing adjustments and creative effects and all of that stuff. A quick history lesson about exposure is that uh, over 15 years ago, exposure was developed for film photographers. Uh, most of them struggled with the transition from working with, you know, analog film and chemistry in the darkroom to editing images in a computer. And that was a tough transition for a lot of people. So exposure developed accurate film emulation presets that really gave them back the old feel and look of the analog film that they were used to working with. And that's kind of what they needed at the time. So that began there. So before we get into the demonstration, I just want to give you guys a little bit of inf or heads up here is that I will want to, um, we are monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions for us, you can go ahead and ask them. Uh, so we will um, uh, handle them there. Nate's watching the chat right here. So if you do have, see, look at him, man, it's like we rehearsed this. Anyway, so yeah, Nate's there watching the chat. If you guys have any other points uh, as I'm going through the demo that I maybe didn't talk or touch on, or if you have a data point specifically, uh, you can ask it there. If I don't handle ask answering it during the demonstration, then I will come back to it and do and make sure to get it answered in the Q&A part at the end. Okay, so with all of that said, let's um, talk about what makes exposure or how exposure makes organizing images hassle-free. So as we begin, here I'm taking a look inside of exposure. I'm just going to hit escape, and then I'm going to put hit tab. So Exposure X7 is what I'm using here. In Exposure X7, we have different workspaces. And so I'm using the culling workspace. And then I clicked editing just to show you that it's easy to switch. <laughs> there we go. Back to the culling workspace. Did that look planned? It wasn't planned. Anyway, so where we begin is copying images from a camera card. That's usually the start of the process. And so I'm going to open that panel here from the file menu. Now, when you use exposure or when you plug a camera card into your computer, exposure usually recognizes it and will bring up this panel um, at the beginning. But some people don't like that happening. And so you can set the preference so that it doesn't automatically come up when you plug in one of your, you know, uh, camera cards or whatever. Uh, but you can do that in the preferences panel and exposures preferences. All right. So here, as we're looking here on this page, or I mean, uh, on this panel, we have th three numbered sections across the top. Uh, before we go into that, I want to say that exposure handles a bunch of different raw files. Um, in addition to TIFF files, JPEG files, DNG files, and Photoshop PSD files as well. Um, so you'll see a whole bunch of images when you're looking through uh, your folders on your computers with exposure. So we're going to go to the camera card that we have plugged in here. And then in here in the middle, this is where we're going to review the images. Okay, so we can see on the camera card there are several folders. So I'm just going to close that folder here. And same thing with this one. It's pretty easy to say that, oh, I want to look at these files. This one in the John Barclay folder. So what I can do, um, I want to select the images that I want to copy from the card here. And I can do that quickly because I don't want to include the ones in these other folders. So I'll deselect those. So now, how do I know if I don't have them selected because they're closed? You can see right down here on the bottom of the panel, it says 30 source files and 30 are going to be copied. So it's telling me that I have 30 selected. So you can see right here in the folder view, it says 30 files. So 
obviously, if these are open, you see they're not selected, and that's why they're dark. Okay, so we're going to copy all those files. Now on the right is where we will set our destination and options. This is the third part of this uh, panel. And so there's a bunch of options here. As you can see that I have a bunch of them set up even. But don't let that be intimidating. There are a whole bunch of tools here that are great to use to organize your images when you copy them over to your file or to your computer, excuse me. You can set it to just a regular old destination like the desktop. Right here, I have another folder. It's on the desktop in a photos folder. And then you can see that I'm actually generating, I have it set up to generate a subfolder by the copyright information that's embedded in these files. So I'm gonna undo that stuff. We'll just get rid of those things. But I do wanna have a subfolder that has the name of the photographer. There we go. John Barclay's images, John Barclay's folder. So that's pretty simple, right? A simple, straightforward use. We wanna save it into this folder with this subfolder. We're gonna move all those images in there. Okay, so we have some other options here. We're not gonna really need those for today's demo, but you can automatically convert raw files to DNG if you need to. Oh, you can also rename those copied files. And you can see here also, I'm using a metadata information to automatically populate this rename. So provided all these uh, all these images here, or maybe your camera has your copyright information set up on it, then whenever you take a picture, it'll automatically have copyright there. So you can put your name there or your studio or whatever. But again, we don't really need to use this for the demo. I can just move these images over and use the same um, file names because I'm, I'm moving them into a folder. But there's a lot of options here. I just wanted to point that out. So I'm gonna turn that off. Metadata gives some extra information to your images, such as copyright name, email address, so that they can contact you for um, that for you know photography purposes. We can also add images into collections to organize them um, in exposure when you have them over there. And we can assign keywords, metadata keywords. Also, we can assign presets, as you can see here on the bottom. I have Kodak Trix 400 selected as one of the presets. So that means all these images will automatically be converted to black and white with this preset. If I wanted to, I can add another preset in here just because I want to add another preset uh, for the demonstration. And then it says here on the bottom with multiple presets, each one will be as a virtual copy. So that means there'll be two copies of each one of these images in the grid view. One will be black and white, and the other one will be, well, kind of dingy gray, probably. Anyway, I wanted to show that that is an, also a possibility. We're not going to do that for today's demo, but I'm going to turn that off. Anyway, so now we'll click OK, and it's going to copy these images from the camera card over to the computer really lightning fast. There they are. Now, usually during that part where they're copying over from the card, I like to say that you could go to the file or the folder of images and immediately start working on them in exposure. Now that's whether you're doing organizing or whether you're doing editing adjustments to those images. Exposure doesn't have a catalog. And so because it doesn't have a catalog, that gives you a lot of flexibility to immediately begin working, even when they're being copied to your computer. So, so there's no modules also. So all the commands that you use or have in exposure are available to you at all times. So I mentioned that. I wanna also mention that cat, uh, exposure uses a catalog free workflow, okay? So what that means is that the edits that you make are stored in small sidecar files within the image folder rather than in a catalog, okay? So you don't have to mess with the catalog at all. So I want to point out how that works. Here in the folders panel, whoop, on the left, I should do sound effects one day, the entire webinar, all sound effects. Anyway, uh, we're looking at the John Barclay folder. Okay. Now let's take a look at, actually, let's look at another folder because I have edited there. I've edited some of these. So that Andrea Livieri's folder. And then let me bring a finder window over and Shazam. We can see on the desktop here on the left in the photos folder, that's where I have all my photos, Andrea Livieri, 
And here are the images, right? And the sidecar files live right in this folder. So why is that important? Well, it makes backing these images up really easy because you're not ever going to be losing any of the edits that you made because they're in the sidecar file. So all you need to do to back up these images is just drag a copy, let's say, over to a backup hard drive, and that's all you have to do. And, and, oh, and move it right into there when you didn't mean to. Let me undo that. See how easy it is. <laughs> I'm so smooth sometimes. Anyway, it is really easy to move folders. So you can do it that way. And that's one of the great things about having a catalog free workflow is I'm still, oh, it kicked me out of the folder, but let's go back. See, everything's back to normal. We didn't mess anything up, thankfully. Okay, so now we've talked about how we don't have a catalog. So that makes a little bit of things, or it makes a lot of things a lot easier when we're, um, as we go through the rest of this, we don't have to worry about where this information is being stored. They're all being stored right there with your images, everything we do. Okay, so let's go back to our John Barclay folder. Fresh images that we just brought in. Now let's, uh, I'm in the culling uh, workspace. I think I told you, told you guys that before, culling workspace. So that's going to have the metadata panel open so that I have more information about the shots that I look at and the basic panel if I wanna make a few tweaks. And then you can set these up however you want to in exposure these workspaces, but this is just kind of how the standard one works. And I have a really raspy voice here because in North Carolina, along with being rainy and kind of drizzly today, it's also pollen season. So all of us sneeze and have itchy eyes. So I apologize for that. So I have to like drink water all the time so that you guys can hear my voice. Ah, reality. Anyway. All right. Let's talk about how we can organize our images now that we have them copied to our computer and we understand where all this stuff's going to be saved. We can look at the folder panel right here, and we can go through different folders of images to look at different photographers. That's how I have this organized. So that's really quick and easy to do. Um, also, there's another way that you can organize folders, and that's by using collections. They're down here on the photos or on the uh, folders panel at the bottom. So you can set up collections, which are a grouping of images from different places. So you can have images that are on, you know, a hard drive that you have an external hard drive or even on your phone or um, on camera cards, whatever. You can have those things all put into catalog or collections here so that you can look through them quickly and you don't have to worry about having duplicate files or images. Excuse me. Okay. So calling images, there's uh, three ways that we um, that you can call your images, or you, there's three things that you can use to sort your images. So uh, we can assign flags to them, or we can assign star ratings or color labels. Okay. So typically, I would start with uh, a, a pick flag or reject flag. So I would I would mark everything with flags first. So that's what I would suggest. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna put I'm gonna hit tab which is going to close all the panels that I don't need. Now, since I'm just applying my organizing uh, criteria to these different images, then I don't really need to see all those other panels, okay? So I can use the keyboard instead of using the mouse, makes things a lot quicker when you're doing organizing tasks. So you might see me do that instead of seeing my mouse move around. Okay, so let's take a look at flags. Flags are on the left side of each image. You can see them right here. Uh, if you right click, then you can see which one you want to set. Uh, pick flags white, reject flag is dark, and then this is no flag or unset the flag. So if we pick flag, we can see that it gives it a white border and that little flag icon is uh, white or color in. Uh, let's reject one, let me reject this one. Boom, if I hit it again, reject. I'll see how it's dark. So. That's with the mouse. Let's use the keyboard. We can go with the arrow keys. I'm just using those and plus and minus. So uh, plus is a pl is a uh, pick flag and minus is reject flag. Okay. So I'm showing you uh, how quick it can be when you're running through images to you know tell you which ones you want to keep, which ones like work with whatever you want. 
Now, I want you to imagine instead of having 30 files, you have like a thousand files. You know, when you went shooting for a day, you're going to have a lot of duplicate images and things like that. So sometimes you might want to do things like grab a whole series of images and, and then say that you want those to be picked. So you can add a pick flag just like that, you know, things like that. Or if you forgot the lens cap is on, maybe I'm the only one that does that, then you can recheck that one. But anyway, <clears throat> okay, so that's that's our pick flag. Now, why do we want to put our pick flag on there and what does it do for us? Well, we had 30 images in the beginning. So if I now use a filter to filter out just the pick flags, now I only have 11 of those images. So this is a great way for you to just say, these are the ones I want to edit instead of editing every single image that you've ever taken. Okay. So now we can do the same thing with color labels, okay? So I'm gonna hit tab again, close all those panels. Now check this one out. I'm gonna bring this down from the top, this top uh, menu and make these images a little bigger. There we go. So now color labels that you can use. Color labels are, um, actually let's do stars first because that lines up with the keyboard shortcuts. Stars can be applied to uh, give a rating to an image. So one to through five stars. So if you push two on the keyboard, it gives it a two, three is a three. Come on, you guys got that right. Five star image. Then we can use the same thing with our keyboard and give it another rating. Very, very quickly. This is another way that we can go through and sort our images. Okay. And I'm still using the keyboard to go through these, okay? Now, another thing that we can do is apply a, uh, let's see, let me hit some, let me go down to see some more images. Here we go. Click on this one. Yeah. Now, if I hold down the shift key, I can actually apply a rating, let's say, and then it will advance to the next image. So if I hold shift and then give this a four-star rating, see how it jumped to the next one? So when I'm, so this is a great way to actually be like really lightning fast when you're processing your images because it'll jump through these quickly. All right, anyway. Now, the last thing was color labels and color labels you can use um, to identify uh, images for different uses or if you want to apply a black and white preset to some of them just to see what they look like in monochrome. I do that a lot of the time. Then I'll mark it with a color like yellow or whatever. So the color labels are the same way as what we were doing with the numbers with the uh, star, yeah, star ratings. So six through nine. So six is red and then seven is yellow, eight is green and nine is blue. And there is a purple color, but we don't have a 10 button. So if you go down to the bottom of the, oops, let's make sure that everybody can see that there. Go down to the bottom, then purple is there on the bottom. Yeah, we ran out of keys for that one. You can set these differently. All these keyboard commands that I've talked to you about today that I've mentioned, don't feel like you need to memorize those. This is a great time for me to point this out, actually. In the help menu at the top of exposure, you can go down and look at the keyboard shortcuts. They're all listed right here. It'll take you to take a look at all of those. Then you can also look at the manual if you have any questions while you're here. Everything's documented there. And there's a link over to the tutorials area on our website if you do get lost or you need some help explaining um, different processes and exposure. So there's just a couple of things here I wanted to point out. And keyboard shortcuts is one of them. So they're all listed right there. Don't feel like you need to know every, every single thing. All right, so now we've applied all of three of those criteria and then we can use the, let's hit tab again, bring back all our menus. And then we can use the filters here at the bottom to sort and filter these down to the exact images that we want to use, right? So like I said, well, imagine that you had a thousand images, right? Guess what? I just happen to have a thousand images. So at the top of the folders panel, I have this folder and this icon and it is a folder with a blue folder inside of it. Now, uh, if you have that off, then each time that you click on a folder, it's only gonna show you the folder, the images that are inside that folder. If it's activated, it'll show you all the images inside of all the subfolders. Now, look, didn't I say I had like thousands of images? Well, 
I just so happen to have gone through these images from all of these different folders that we're looking in now, all of the subfolders, and I just want the five stars. So you can see how in thousands of images that I have right here at my fingertips, I have my favorite ones from each one or my five star rated ones from each one of these folders. And I can go through and get them and pick them out and whatever I need to do. So it is very beneficial. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. So we were talking about some John Barclay images. We went through how we can organize and we showed you ways that you can apply organization to a much larger scale rather than just me showing you how to apply these things to your images quickly. So that would be the organizing section of the workflow. So now we can get into editing or processing our images in exposure, which is the fun stuff. So let's take a look at some of the images here. <clears throat> One second. Okay. Oh, remember how I said that I used the um, color labels to organize images on occasion? I think I did that here. So if I call green, I believe that I've used all of these green images that I have marked in different videos or, or tutorials or things like that. So let's say we don't want those. We want nothing. I think I might have some other color labels too. Oh, red ones here. Ooh, this was for a webinar that I did about removing haze. I use these images. Huh, look at me organizing. But all the images that don't have any labels on them, those are images that I haven't done anything with. So we'll pick from them. Now it's fresh and new. Okay, this is a good one. So when we talk about editing our images, right? This is not a good one. And you know why it's not a good one? Because it's a JPEG image. See right here at the top? And you know what we want? not JPEG images. So let's grab a not JPEG image, such as one with some nice dense color on it. Here's one from, from Andrea Olivieri. I'm going to Shavnam, that's, hi, how are you? I'm answering you live because you're super cool. Miss you, girl. Um, do you want to add more colors? No, I don't think there's more options right now for that, but that's a really good idea. Okay, back to what I was talking about. I'm going to write that down, actually, before I forget. All right, so we are talking about raw processing, and that's why I wanted to find a raw file. So here we are, raw file. Let me, whoop, I moved over here. Okay, let me close this panel so that we can talk about what we're gonna do to this photo. Okay, so when we're processing our images, I wanna think about processing in two major, let's say, veins. One of my studio professors in college would say bifurcating, but he was um, Hungarian and he had a really like, his accent was very thick. So it was, a, anyway, it was memorable bifurcating so i have my <laughs> anyway i got right i'm random uh what i was talking about was when you think about editing you think about it in two ways you think about correcting issues that's with the photo and then think about something to do totally different that's creative so there's two things that you're doing you're applying something or fixing issues and the next thing is then you edit I will come back to you, Peter. That's a good thing, but I'll show you how to do that um, in the Q&A. Okay, creative editing. So here we are, and we're talking about how we're going to fix issues in this image first, okay? Now, I just said that I was going to be editing in Exposure, so let's move to the editing workspace. You'll see that it's a little bit different, and that's just some different panels are on. You can turn them all on and off if you want to, you can customize all these however you like. So I'm going to close this one again. And we'll start right here at the top at the basic panel. So when we're talking wrong, see, I said when we're talking about applying issue or uh, applying edits, the first thing we want to do is correct any issues that we see. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that 
you know, fixing an exposure level that's a little bit low, looks like little, this one's a little dark, <clears throat> isn't a bad idea from the beginning, but let's think about something from kind of a larger perspective, and that would be lens correction. So something like lens correction is something you really want to do at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the processing workflow. And exposure does have profiles for a whole lot of cameras and a whole lot of lenses. But if yours isn't supported, then you can also do this by hand instead of using the profile right here under manual. And then you can make adjustments there. So that is up to you if you're uh, if you have like an old lens or something crazy, or um, or if it's kind of an obscure model that no one has. You know, sometimes people use wacky lenses that we don't, you know, we've never heard of people using before, which is really cool. But it's hard for us to make profiles for them because we've never seen them. Anyway, so you can put an automatic lens profile on for distortion or vignette correction, and that would be lens vignetting and uh, chromatic aberration correction as well. Now, I don't really see any of that stuff poking up on this image at first blush. Uh, you would notice it on the lines here in the air, you know, right around any of that stuff. You'd see that it would be some bright pixels if you had chromatic aberration. You know, I don't see any. Good job, Andrea. All right, so we don't need to do anything there. We have automatic um, set. So I'm just going to leave that one alone. But that would kind of be the first stop. Another great place to stop would be sharpening. So a lot of the time uh, when you're looking at images, you want to make sure that they're tack sharp when you get them into the computer so that you're not, well, making them less sharp by putting some edits on them specifically. So we can see that we have some really good sharpness here, but we can probably add some more. So we'll just do that. Uh, you're on the sharpening panel. I'll I have a method, and that is that I add a whole bunch of amount of sharpening so I can see how the sharpening is everywhere. And then I dial in the rest of these here so it's easier for me to see what they do. And then I go back and readjust this amount slider, bring it back down. So that's what I'm going to do. When I do that, I'm going to hold the Alt key. So I'm going to set the radius here. Now that'll show me how wide the effect is going to be, the sharpening effect. Now, when I'm doing that, I want sharpened lines, okay? So if I pull the radius all the way over, you can see some muddy area in there of the image bleeding through. I do not want that. Specifically around these highlights down here, you can see a dark halo. Look at those when I hold this. See those dark halos right around those lights down there? That is bad. That's just going to show is what that is, okay? So I wanna bring that down to minimize the effects like that haloing there. You can also see the haloing on these lines up at the top. So I'll bring that down to where I don't really have a lot of it. Now it looks like it's almost invisible and I, I wonder if you can actually see it in the video. On my screen, I have my brightness all the way up and I can just barely make out the lines and that's kind of where I wanna be. So that's a good amount for this image. Now the detail, this is a landscape image, so I can add sharpening in, uh, I can add a lot of detail sharpening, which can make something look like uh, you can, um, has more grain almost. If you're doing something like a portrait, I wouldn't recommend a ton of sharpening detail, but you can get away with more on a landscape. So they can deal with, you know, a little bit harsher look, harsher effects, because, you know, it'll make somebody's face look a little weird. Anyway, back to what we're doing. Now, masking slider, I'm going to hold down Alt again. And that is going to show me how much contrast the, co the edge has to have for me to select it for the sharpening. So as I drag down, it looks like a line work art, which is kind of what we're wanting, line work art. And that means that the sharpening is only going to happen on those lines, and it's not going to happen in the middle where it's dark. Okay. So now, now you should be able to notice that this is way sharpened right here. We're right on the edge of this um, roof here, like kill sharpening. Let's bring that down so that it blends it back in with that image. And now you can see where it makes these edges pop. So when we're looking at it, it looks really nice and tack sharp. So that's just a little bit of sharpening lesson for you. Anyway, that's another thing. We were fixing an issue with the image. And so as we're thinking about that, another thing that we would think about is 
fixing issues like distortion or perspective correction. So inside of exposure, you do that with the uh, crop panel open. You can see all your tools are here for keystoning and corrections like that. And I'm trying to, this does not look like it's off at all. This one might look a little bit off, but I don't think that we could really tweak this one and make it look any better. Let's try another. So sometimes the alignment grid, like on this image, when you're trying to fix perspective correction, you need to have a different looking grid, right? So uh, let's use the grid. No, oh, I want grid. Alignment grid. There. Okay, so as I'm dragging this grid around, I'm trying to look for lines, vertical lines and horizontal lines in the image that look askew. And dang. Okay, so there's none. So we're just gonna not do that. That's pretty straight. If we needed to apply some sort of uh, perspective correction, we could here. I just wanted to point out that that would be a really good thing to do at the beginning of your workflow. So you don't edit and put vignettes on it and all that stuff and then crop it out later. I do that all the time, which is why I'm telling you to do it this way. Okay, let's talk about creative editing now. So we've, we've talked about fixing some of the issues that we typically have in images or with images. So now let's talk about what we would do typically to edit an image. So for that, I'm going to go over to the presets panel on the left and the presets are right here. They are organized into folders by type. So you can look along the top here and look at all of them or just color looks. And then you can open up the different folders of options and scroll through them. Now you'll notice that as I do that, you can see the different effects apply to the image, the big preview image. That's what this is called in the center of the screen. Also, let's look through some of these too. So there's a bunch of different looks from all different uh, eras of photography and even modern stuff that's coming out right now. Uh, we can go back in time with some old, uh, what was this would be uh, large format um, Polaroid films. I th yeah, these are all large format, I think. The pull and peel, but they're big. They're eight by 10, I think. Anyway, this was like high fashion. They used to do all this kind of stuff for, the, for that, those looks like in the 70s and 60s and 80s even. Um, print options are really good for low contrast. As you can see, there's a low contrast variety as well. Uh, for low contrast images where uh, maybe you don't want to punch up contrast and detail like a portrait. So low contrast print color films, those are all good options for portraits. Uh, since we're looking at a landscape here, we can do stuff like these slide films, which emulate much stronger, harsher looks like Fuji Velvia. I actually like Fuji Velvia more on green than I do on blue. So that's just a personal taste, but you know, I think it just does a little bit more for it when it's green. Anyway, even old Kodachromes are on here. So there's some good looks there. Let's uh, take a peek at some black and white options too. God, these are all black and white films from all different kind or all different decades and eras. Uh, I used to shoot with um, Tri-X 400 when I was at school. And so <laughs> this is, I love this one. Anyway, uh, it looks really neat. All these black and white looks, there's, there's tons of them in here. And, uh, and you can choose and select between them. So let's say we choose one of our black and white presets. I just clicked on it to apply it. Uh, and then let's look here in the layers panel on the right. I want to point out something. So if we find a look that we like, we just click. So let's, let's say that we don't really like black and white. We'll go back to color and say, um, you know, instead I want to go back to, uh, no, that was the wrong one. Instead, I want to go back to um, ooh, one of these old faded vintage looks like that. Now, in our layers panel, remember I pointed it out, this has been changed now. We applied our black and white preset and, and then we apply this Kodachrome or Autochrome preset and it overwrote that black and white preset. However, sharpening, what we touched before, our sharpening, our lens correction, our cropping, that stuff was not affected by applying this preset. So I did want to point that out that we didn't waste our time there. So as we're changing or looking through our different presets here, 
one of the great things is that it can give you an idea as to what you want to do with that image. Okay. I'm trying to think of something here that would have a nice orange tone to it. Cause I think that would help this. Here we go. So I have my autochrome preset going right here on this image. And now I want to add another one over the top. So I'm just going to click this color wash orange, drag it on up right here above the other one on add layer. And now I have a new layer with that color wash orange effect on it. So I, the reason I'm showing you this is that don't think that one preset alone is going to be enough. It's totally fine to apply different looks and then blend them together, just like I'm doing here. So let's say with that autochrome effect was a little too strong for us. We lower that opacity of that layer, make it blend together with that orangey cast coming in from the left. That looks cool. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So I'm going to undo this. And I'm going to take that back up. And let's find one with a border. That's going to be better. There we go. Cool. So now I'll close this presets panel. We've talked about how we can find some presets, how we can grab presets and apply them to our images, and how we can use our layers. Now, layers functionality, there's a ton of functionality there for adding your layers. Um, you can add really as many as you'd want to. Um, <laughs> but I think that there's, uh, let me think about that. I actually think that there is, I'm trying to answer, answer your, your question live here. I think that there, if you get it above, like in the hundreds, I think that it really just will start to run real slow, but I don't think that there's a, an official maximum number of layers that you could add. I know that I've worked with like 40 or 50 layers before on images. So, and it worked. Okay, back to what I was talking about. So we just looked at our presets. We're coming back. Now we're, let's talk about how we can edit this, the, our image. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the first things kind of beginning this whole process is to do some basic tweaks to the image. So... I did put a preset on here, but before I put that preset, I really should maybe adjust the exposure and contrast and highlights and all that stuff. So one, one quick way to do that is to use the auto functionality and exposure, which looks at the original image. It does not look at the preset. I'm pretty sure I'm right. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nate. But yeah, it looks at the original image and then it intelligently applies adjustments to correct that image just to bring it to a place where it looks good to your eye, kind of a standard edit. Now you can adjust that in exposure by um, underneath the menu at the top of that panel and tell it how strong you want it to apply the different effects or which ones you want it to include or not. So that's kind of uh, how you can set up your auto enhancements there. I think it did a good job. Like the thing that I was seeing in this image in particular was that this sky here did not have a really good break between the horizon. And now I feel like it looks great. Like that horizon reads instantly and that this lower line here reads instantly. So I, I think that did great for, the, for this. So that's the basic panel. Now we can adjust our, our, all of these sliders if we want to on top of the auto adjustments, of course. And when you do that in exposure, we recommend or suggest that you start at the top of the panel and you work your way down through the different sliders. So if you're going to make adjustments to exposure, for example, I'm going to show you with the histogram open. It'll give you a little bit more visual. So the histogram is a graphical representation of all the different tones that you see in your image. So as we make adjustments, look at what happens to it. You can see how it grows and shrinks, okay? So I'm going to move that back to where it was. That was at 0.3, about a third of a stop up, okay? And now if I make an adjustment to, let's say, the whites, uh -huh, see it's at 11.5. Now, do you see how much it changed? I'm going to do it again here. Let me, let me bring it down. Look at the whites area of the histogram. That's all the way down. Now I'll bring it all the way up. So it's only affecting a very small amount of tones in the image. So when I say start at the top of the panel, this slider right here makes a huge difference to how the image is gonna look. It controls all of the tones. 
Whereas these sliders down here are only refining the little bits on this curve rather than all of the tones together. So yeah, so if you have an issue inside of your image and you're like, well, I have to take this slider and it has to go all the way down whatever which way, most likely it's because some of the other sliders that are above it have not been adjusted enough to make that happen for the image. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, so there we go. Made some adjustments. It's looking good. We almost put it back the way it was. There, put it back the way it was. Perfect. And okay, so the next thing, let's take a look at how we can apply some different edits. I'm going to change. Let's look at a different image here. Actually, let's look at a different folder too. So we're here inside of Exposure, and you remember that I went to the editing workspace. I'm not in the culling workspace, but I can still get to where I need to go. I just open the folders panel, and then I can hop over to another uh, folder of images like this one. Because I like this truck. I'm going to get me a truck. That was North Carolina speak for everyone out there. <laughs> anyway, so we do have a spot heel tool, and we have a um, clone tool. And the reason we have two of those is they have kind of two different uses. One, the clone tool is good for when you're trying to, let's say, clone something out uh, when there's a texture around it. So typically when I'm looking at an image, the first thing that I'm going to do is run my eye along that edge and see if there's anything that obstructs it or makes my eye kind of look at the edge of the image. So things like this Ooh, let's zoom in. I'm going to hold Command and Plus. And now you can hold this space bar and see how my cursor turns to a hand. That lets me move down. See that guy right there? Irritating. So I will use the clone tool in this scenario because there's texture around the outside of it and I want it to disappear. So I would select on it like that. And you can see that it says it's a clone and the opacity is at 100. Now it's a little bit hard to see here because it's this green, but there's a dotted line connecting this to the sample area and I can't see it. <laughs> Where'd it go? Huh. Well, I was going to show you that you can grab the other part and move it, but I can't find it. Where'd it go? That's weird. I'm going to delete that. Oh, let's do that again. I hate it when things don't go right when I'm demoing something. Space bar. Let's try it out there. Okay. It's going to work. See, that's blurry, so it's up here. Well. That's weird. I think that it's just because my eyes can't make out the dotted lines in the green. Anyway, once you place it, there's another part. There's another um, the source area where it goes to, and you can move it around. Let me try it up here. Yeah, see? This one's right here. You can move it around to grab another source. That's what I was trying to show you, but I can't see it down there. So anyway, sorry about that, guys. So yeah, the clone tool is great for removing stuff like that. The spot or the uh, heel tool, here it is right here. You turn it to the heel brush. That's good for doing things like blemishes on skin or if there's something in a smooth area that you want to take out and have it smoothed, then use the, the clone or the uh, heel brush for that. So I did want to show that that option was there. I know I wasn't looking at a portrait, but it's useful in a lot of scenarios, not just portraits. Okay, so... Let's talk about, we talked about the basic panel, right? And that you work your way from the top of the panel 
Ooh, I'm going to do it here too. Let's see what it does to this image. See just a little tiny bit of curve there. Let's let, I'll hold down this uh, backslash key. And you can see a little bit of fluctuation. That's the before and after. It does give it a little bit more presence. Okay, cool. So yeah, so we start at the top of the panel, work our way down. We talked about the basic panel already, but let's talk about the color panel. Color panel is a great way to, I know you're going to expect it, but adjust color. So there's a few ways to do that and adjusting, your, adjusting the colors in your image is kind of an artistic thing. So there's a bunch of different options that you have that give you different feel or different control. So give them a try, you know, if you haven't used them before. Color filter will apply what was like a plastic lens type effect over the end of, of the camera. Uh, so it gives it a tint all the way across the image on all of the tones. And you can use things like this to, excuse me, brighten things up or excuse me, warm things up or cool things down, cool things down, warm things up. Or you can uh, grab a hold of just a little quick slider here to add some cool or warm effect. Pretty easy. Uh, down below, you can also uh, change these colors to whatever you want or make it super dense so it's more or stronger than it is before. So I did want to point out that that stuff's there too. But I don't need a ton of it. Usually when I'm doing some like color toning like that, I, I want it to be more subtle than I do anything else. So let's turn that back down there. Good. So down below, we have the HSL area, hue, saturation, and luminance. The hue, saturation, and luminance controls give you a ton of um, control <laughs> over the colors in your image. So you can manipulate individual tones. So if the red in this uh, truck's rust here isn't quite red enough for you, rather than making it to a blue, which might make it look pink, then you can bring it over more orangey if you wanted to. Uh, you can also take the orange tones that are in it and make those more red as well, rather than more, uh, well, orangey, yellowy, right? So we can make little adjustments like that that are, or small adjustments like that that are only going to be affecting certain tones within the image. So let's say we want a really green grass. So we're gonna make our cyans a little bit more, no, we're gonna make our greens a little bit more green blue than we are yellow. See, look at that. Now it's Kentucky bluegrass. Anyway, so nice, quick, and easy things that you can do here. Uh, also, we can that's just adjusting the color tone or hue. We can do the same thing with our saturation. Uh, for example, we can, and instead of, well, we had to make a, a couple of adjustments here to have our reds and oranges. And so, reds and oranges at the same time. Let's say that we wanna make that a little bit bolder, the reds and oranges of our rust, but we don't wanna to have to mess with both of those sliders. We can use our color tool here. So we'll select the tool and then grab kind of in the middle tone of what you want. And you can see as we drag that up to add saturation, it'll grab all of the tones there that I grab. So that is both red and orange. So we leave the tool on and we can do it again with this lower part and you can see that that's more orange and the back part, which is gonna be probably more orange too. So now we have lots more color on that truck, but something that makes little things like this metal more shiny is absence of color. So if I wanna make this extra shiny, then I can drag the down on the blues. That's what you see most in Chrome. So anyway, that's a quick way of adding some color saturation so that you're not overdoing it here. And we can do the same thing with the luminance controls, which is the brightness value or, whatever, or tone in uh, the color. So let's say that their orange is on here still is a little bit too bright. So we can bring the oranges down and we'll see that the truck gets definitely more rusty looking in my opinion now. I think before this looks like it was paint and now it looks like rust. I'm a rust connoisseur. Anyway, so that's a way that we can make some adjustments to color and using the different tools in the color panel. Those are great ways of controlling color in your photos. 
So let's talk now about the tone. Oops, let's talk about the tone curve panel, which we're kind of on the same wavelength as we were with the color panel. This is just a different way of uh, making adjustments to your image. Like you can do it's very similar effects on all these different panels. So this is a curve editor. If you spend time in Photoshop with curves, then and you like it, then you are right at home right here. However, it's a little confusing to some people like me. So we have preset curves built in here so that you can do different things that we wouldn't commonly do inside of the curve editor, such as add milky blacks, which gives this, uh, you can see the undercarriage of the truck there. I can see there's a lot more detail in here now almost. Uh, it grabbed a bunch of those tones back. So let's turn the effects of the panel off here and we'll see the before and after and back on. Now you can see that gray, how it did that. That looks cool. So yeah, if you want to uh, make adjustments inside the curve editor, you can. You can grab a hold of the little dots, move them or points rather, not dots, and move them around. You can add more if you want, or you can delete them by just dragging them off. So get rid of that one, All right? And this is to raise the black point. It's right on the edge, All right? And this would be to lower the white point if you want to have it so that the white, it's not perfectly white. Some people like that look too. So you can drag that down. There we go. And then we can put that curve, that point right back in the curve if we wanted to. Or you could use these sliders down below to do a lot of the same stuff that you would do in the curve editor just by making adjustments. And it shows you in a dotted line. So that's kind of nice because then you don't really need to know how to use the curve editor. Anyway, it's kind of cheating, I know. But hey, I learned a lot about curves when I was playing with those pre these sliders right here. Okay, down at the bottom, we have split toning, which is an awesome way of adding or introduce color toning to different areas of your image. Now, split toning is based off of the color or based off of the brightness value of the tones. Okay, so it's, it's easier to see in black and white than it is in color. And which is why this stripe here is in black and white. So again, there's presets and black and white looks is very common. You would see, uh, you know, split toning looks on black and white photos, but they look pretty cool when you put them on color photos too. But we actually have some for color photos. They're just set to different, you know, temperatures and all that stuff, different color. But you can move them and change them and make them as strong or as weak as you'd like. Typically, I am very shy away from adding cool tones to images. I don't know why. But I do. Anyway, that's just me. Okay, that was split toning. All right. Now, we're still talking about, we're making creative effects now. So now that we've processed our image, we started with a shot. We have gave, gave it some sharpening, you know, all that kind of stuff. We took out the really annoying little grass guy down here. I mean, we're making some progress with this guy. It's really looking cool to me. So we want to think we're still doing creative stuff. We want to jump more into creative stuff and how we can add some cool creative stuff to take this image up a notch. And they, you know, these tricks are real simple. So let's, let's delve in. Vignette is a good thing to do to draw attention subtly to your subject. Now, if you look really close, that was me reading. Uh, sorry. If you look really close, we can see that we have a vignette effect that's happening here already. Now that's kind of that's just because that's how the camera works. Okay. So I want to strengthen that because I like that look. You can tell on this image, it's just really easy to see. So since I like that look, I can either choose from a preset because presets make everything easy. Well, they at least get me in the right direction. So I'll just choose from a preset here. And then I'll start. Remember what I said? We're going to start our way down the list. Except I'm going to break that rule this time because I want the vignette center to be the vehicle rather than the middle of the image. So that's the first thing I'm going to do is move that down. And then I'm going to leave the amount really strong for now, even though I'm not going to use that. Okay. 
So I'm going to move the softness off. I'm going to turn that all the way off and we can see how it's kind of distorted, which I like. But I want it to make sure that I have most of the truck in that and not necessarily the edge. So I'm going to, you know, do a couple of little adjustments to make sure that my vignette's working around my truck. And I can even randomize it a little bit. There we go. That's better. Did you see that? Hit random seed. It randomizes the lumps that create this distortion. Then that looks good. So, so the whole truck's in. Then I'll add my softness back in and make it kind of fade away. Now we can actually, I'm going to bring it back there. Now we have it fade away. And, and then I can bring my amount back down until it looks like it's more something that I like. I want it to look like it's, you know, it was done there in the camera. That looks good. So let's turn that we can always turn the effects of each of the adjustments that we make on and off, or we can ch uh, choose the entire, of, we can choose the entire panel in this case, the vignette. So there it is. Awesome. Making good progress. we got a couple more things to do and then we're going to be wrapping this guy up. Okay. So we talked about, we didn't talk about bokeh. Okay, so bokeh is the is a word that talks about the quality of the out of focus areas of an image. Okay, and it's Japanese in origin, and that's why it says bokeh. That's what everybody's told me because I've been corrected about it a bunch of times. But hey, I don't care. I mean, I'm not. I don't know. Whatever. Let's keep moving. So bokeh is manipulator controlled by focus regions as you can see there's one here in the middle of the screen that's by default it comes up but you can't see anything else going on so let's give it an amount of blur there we can see now where the blur is and where it's not blurry so the not blurry part is controllable and we can move that to shape it however we would want to the old truck image here and then we can move, this is the feathering edge. That's the edge that's dotted. That's where the effect is full on. So if I move that edge way out, then it's going to fade from no blur to a little bit of blur, right? So that's what I'm gonna do. Now, all I did was strengthen the already what's going on um, bokeh in this image, but you can see here on this bottom front corner where I was looking at that grass, before and the corner here where I was looking at grass before those both have some nice subtle blurring effects happening to them too to now that will draw your your eye into the shot a little bit better so I'm going to close that when I close the bokeh panel then you'll notice that all those tools go away and the bokeh stays all right so let's chat on grain really fast uh, grain and exposures amazing you have a lot of control over the way that grain appears on your image it is a beautiful way to add an analog look to a photo um, and when you're working on rusty old trucks pictures of rusty old trucks then it's a really really great thing that could add some benefit to this photo to help it to look more vintage so i zoomed in really close you'll notice that before i add grain that's because i actually want to see what's going on and you also may notice that there is a little bit of digital noise back here in this background, specifically because it's, well, probably because it's blue. But I don't want to see that. I'd rather see grain than I would digital noise. So let's add some grain, and I'll just choose from one of the presets here. Now, you'll notice that I chose a 25 preset, 25%. Okay, So at 25%, this looks strong to me on the background. That's why I chose that one. Now I'm going to turn it up so that everybody can see. So it's really easy to see what the effects doing. But when you do apply grain effects, sometimes make them very, very subtle and you will thank me later. <laughs> That's my recommendation. But I did want to show you that inside of exposure, you can move uh, or you can adjust where our grain is appearing. And so right now uh, I don't, here it is in the midtones back here, and that's way too much for me. So if I drag the midtones slider down, then it's going to make the 
grain in that area a lot less abrupt. So now you can see how it's more grainy. It looks more like leather, right? Grain looks like that when you're zoomed in on it. It's clumpy. So uh, if I don't, I don't really see any grain on the highlights here at all, but I do see a little bit in the shadows. So I can add some more in the highlights until, uh, that's way too much. I can add some more in the highlights until I can see it and it registers. That's kind of what I go by. So for this image, that's what I would do. I think that looks good. Now, again, I put this really strong so that you could see it. So then I would back it down, maybe even into this area for the final. There we go. That looks good. Okay. So grain, lots and lots of options with grain too. We can add more roughness to the type of grain. You can even give more color variation or you can add push processing, which will do both give more roughness to the grain and add more contrast to the image at the same time. And, or you can change the size of the grain for different film stocks like 50 millimeter or yeah, or 120 film or uh, four by five view film. You can choose from those and the larger the film, the smaller the grain will be. If you're looking to remake analog looks, this is a really uh, awesome feature. Okay, cool. So we have touched on a heck of a lot of stuff. Let's talk about layers really quick because I haven't talked about layers and then we'll wrap up our presentation, okay? So we've done all of this editing so that our image looks good. We're gonna hold down the backslash key again. This is our before image and our after image. And wow, it totally looks like an old rusty truck right now. And it even looks kind of like a postcard right now, which I like. Cool. So what could we do with our layers to, I guess, add to this, right? We have all of the edits that we made and we can see them here with this little uh, arrows here on each of these panels. That means that there's edits made on those panels on the layer. So let's rename this one our edits. So our edits layer. And then, well, we talked about we were gonna add a preset before and I don't think I actually did. So let's look at adding a cool effect preset. And I do think that the vintage is gonna go well with this uh, or a vintage look will go really well. Oh, maybe we should do black and white. Quick decision, let's do black and white. But I wanna do like a vintage one, like with some toning. That's cool. Okay, now I'm gonna drag that over to a new layer. Now I'm doing that by design. I want to be able to have my black and white layer separate to my color labor layer, and I can make adjustments to it. And this actually raises a pretty good point. Uh, this dialog is telling us that the blend base adjustment that I have right here uh, is set to black and white blend mode instead of color blend mode. Now, if I want to, and I actually do want it set to black and white blend mode this time, but I'll explain why. I'm going to set it to color, which is not what I want. And then as I drag this daguerreotype look lower, you're going to start to see the in image and the coloring from down below up on my daguerreotype preset, right? So the lower it is, the less of it you see. Higher it is, the more of it you see. Okay. Now, this type of effect that I've done right here is a really cool way of making a hand-painted look. If you wanted to do a hand-painted look, this is what I would do. I would make your color look down here on the bottom, put a black and white look here on the top that's nice and stout, and then use your brush mask and a little patience. And I would turn your flow down and work your way. Oh, I did that backwards. And work your way along here with the eraser at a very low opacity. 
And you can see how, as I do that, I am hand painting Le Truck, just like this. So this is something that the layers functionality does for you inside of Exposure. It enables you to do a whole bunch of really cool effects on your images to give them different types of looks. Now, this is just something that, I mean, anybody can do this, right? So I, anyway, I'm, I don't want to get too much into how to do a look like or remake a look as much as experiment or suggest that you experiment with a bunch of different ways of doing things, especially when you're working in exposure. So there we go. Shazam, hand-painted truck, vintage style. That is a really cool look. Okay, so now let's let's wrap it up. We've talked about layers, talked about layer masks. There's a whole bunch of functionality inside of layers and layer masks and exposure. I didn't really touch on it. I did here with the little mask that we made our brush, you know, where we painted our truck with our brush effect, but there are a whole bunch of options there for automatic selections and detailed things that use color and things like that. And so we have bunches of videos on our website that'll take you through all of that stuff. All right. So one thing that we did was edit this photo. I think that you guys would agree with me on that. And everything that we've did has been recorded and it's right here in the history panel. So in the history panel, we can go back through the edits that we've made and step all the way back. And I do mean all the way back. Now you can delete the history or clear it on your image, but then you can't go back if you ever wanted to and rechange or change something that you did that you don't te technically or you don't like or whatever later. So that's important that history stays with your image. So remember that I said that um, at the beginning when we were working on our folders, photos, excuse me, that all the information was being saved in our sidecar files. And our sidecar files are right here within the folder of images. See, here's Michael Gilman's folder. And there they are. Okay. Now, if I wanted to, let's say, work with an outside collaborator, uh, and I had a, a system like Dropbox, I can take this entire folder of all of these images and drag that over onto that Dropbox folder. Oink, right? And as long as me and that other person have that folder or drive or whatever it is synced with our computer, then we're going to see all of the edits made from e either one of the computers. So that's a great way to work with somebody else and collaborate. And it does help with the, um, and it does help with collaboration or it helps making it easy to collaborate with everybody else. So can you go through the history? Yes. You would just go back one step. So if, I, if I'm here, wherever I did my layer intensity, if I just go back and click, then I can change again. Let's say instead of 71, I want it 63. Then I can redo it there. There, I like it a little better. Like, no, nah, it's a little bit too much. <laughs> you can see how it's saving it all. Anyway, okay. So the last thing we got to talk about is how to get our images out of exposure. Because now that we have this in exposure, we want to get it out. And what we do is export. And so how we do that in exposure is we go to the export dialog. Now the export dialog has a lot of the same options as the copy from card dialog. Uh, and that would be how to copy images in. And you had to give it a destination, which had a folder remember, and options for subfolders. So that's the same. We also had the file naming sequence that we went through where we were going to rename our files, which is the same. So we can use that if we wanted to. Uh, th this also has file settings. So we can decide if we want a JPEG file or if we want a TIFF file, PSD file, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can also add output sharpening if we're going to be printing our file. Leave that here. And we can decide on if we're going to include metadata with the files that we export, including things like uh, watermarks, even though that's not his name. So we're not going to include that. But these are watermarks that I have set up here in Exposure. So if you want to add watermarks, you can do that too. 
let's no artwork. And then we can, on the bottom here, tell it how large we want that image to be when we're exporting it. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do that. Okay. And then you just hit export and exposure will export a copy of the image with all of the adjustments that we made to it to the photo or to file that you selected. Now you can do this even quicker if you use the quick export functionality. So let me bring that quick export dialog up. So I want you to think about when you're exporting an image as a recipe of what type of image you want. And that would include these things. Here's the recipe, where it goes, what it's called, what it is, what you include with it, and how big it is. And that's all of these different things have been set up in this dialog here. So you can see here on the bottom, if I select multiple, then I can export for Facebook and Twitter and Instagram 500px, or even make a large print all at the same time by using the quick export recipes. So you can set these up. They have a bunch automatically that will come automatically in exposure, but you can set these up for whatever size uh, or needs that you want. And so then notice I have one image selected in there in exposure. It's saying it's going to be exporting five because I have five presets. So that will be making all five of those different sized images for me in the background when I hit export. And that's it. That concludes our demonstration. So before I turn attention over to the questions, I want to uh, give you guys a couple of comments. And that would be, uh, if you'd like to get in contact with other exposure users to talk about using exposure and share some of your favorite photos, things like that, uh, how you make different looks, that would be great. Please do so. Here's the exposure users group. It is a great place to share stuff like that. That is the exposure user group on Facebook. Also, if you want to share images with us on, uh, somebody was watching and they did it on purpose. I'm mad at you, whoever that, <laughs> anyway, uh, somebody, if you want to share with us on Instagram, you can, please do. Uh, and please tag your images with our hashtag, my exposure edit. We spend a lot of time combing over these different images here. Like this is where we get in contact with everybody we feature. Thank you guys again for watching and thank you for your interest and in exposure.